Welcome back, my fellow wrestling fans. This is Just the Worst Wrestling Podcast, episode number 14, to be perfectly precise. And as usual, I'm your host, Billy Donnelly, who you can find at JoeBlow.com. This is Infamous, and of course, right here at Just the Worst Podcast. And as we like to do every single week and every single show, I'd like to bring on somebody with some uh, knowledge of the wrestling world, wrestling industry, the world of professional wrestling sp- slash sports entertainment, uh, to talk about what's going on in the business. Uh, their experience and uh, their opinion, basically. And uh, this week, joining me, a huge wrestling fan I know, uh, going to be talking to us and helping break down this week's WWE TLC pay per view or special event or whatever the hell they call these things. Uh, tables, ladders, and chairs, as well as the aftermath that uh, that led into Monday Night Raw this week. So uh, he, you can find his work on IGN TV. Uh, so he's a writer for IGN. You can also find him on Twitter at the Matt Fowler. Matt Fowler. So thanks, Matt, for joining us this week, man. Uh, my pleasure. Yeah, that's me. Uh, I like that you uh, wanted to find someone with a lot of wrestling knowledge. I was waiting for you to say, but instead we got Matt Fowler. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't. I, God, I don't podcast much, so forgive me, everyone. Uh, I'm not used to talking about wrestling out loud. Isn't that weird? Um, I talk about TV a lot, but not so much wrestling. I write about it a lot, but so this will be a, a so, somewhat new experience for me. See, and 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 the reason I I know uh, how into wrestling you are is is via Twitter. This Twitter is like the great equalizer uh, as far as finding out who is into the very things that you are into. Uh, and and it's always amazing to me when when it's time to look for people to to sign up. Or not to sign up, but to, to, to recruit, to bring in and, and try and lure to do an episode. Uh, how often I forget who exactly is into wrestling. Um, and when you, you're on Twitter, you're on social media, you very quickly realize, especially when Raw is on or pay-per-views are on and, and people are tweeting about it, just who is into it. And you're like, oh, I totally forgot that. <laughs> I was also into wrestling, so uh, so I I knew, and I was like, well, let me let me reach out uh, one of these weeks and try and get you on the show. And um, yeah, it, it you know this is one of those uh, those forums where we're able to talk about wrestling, and and you know like it's always cool to be able to talk wrestling with people who also enjoy wrestling and just kind of let your freak flag fly and put it all out there. So I'm glad that we can. Break your wrestling podcast cherry. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, like I've spoken about it for like 10 minute increments and that's about as, as much as I'm good for. So let's see how this works out. All right, let's, uh, let's yeah, let's see how it works out. Oh, and as far as like, yeah, finding out who gets into wrestling uh, via Twitter. Yeah, on Sunday and Monday nights, occasionally you'll start seeing new people tweet about it. We, whether it's a uh, uh, whatever they're calling it on the pay-per-views, like you said, network feasts or whatever they are on Sunday nights and then uh Monday Night Raw, but then you find out people like Melissa Joan Hart and all these like, you know, celebrities that you wouldn't, you know, they're, they're the ones who sort of keep it a little more close to the chest, their love of wrestling. But uh, some of them just come right out and start live tweeting along with events like, uh, you know, Shane West will do that. Uh, other people do. So, yeah, it's really interesting. TLC, uh, I think, and we mentioned this briefly before the, the podcast, but we'll talk about Raw, too, because there was sort of a two part story that went down uh, with TLC and Raw. Yeah, you, I mean, usually when we when we kind of do uh, our, our reaction shows for pay-per-views, I like to wait until after Raw happens because sometimes you watch pay-per-view um, and and everything kind of unfolds and then you don't really get the full context or perspective of where things are going until you see how it plays out on Raw, you know, how it feeds into what they're going to do next. So you can watch something on Sunday night and you can say, oh, that, that played out excellently or, oh, this is bullshit. Uh, but you don't really know until they take that first step without having kind of that knee-jerk reaction. So um, I think TLC here and, and the discussion we're going to have is, is going to perfectly uh, showcase that because, yeah, as you mentioned, it is kind of a two-part story and, and the way that one show kind of fed into the other in order to kind of complete at least the the main event arc that they wanted to tell, uh, I think is kind of really interesting. So um, let's get let's get right into to TLC. We'll start at the main event level 
uh, and, and we'll work our way th- uh, through the rest of the card. Um, but here, main eventing, uh, the Tables, Ladders, and Chairs special event was Roman Reigns versus Sheamus in a TLC match for the World Heavyweight Championship. Uh, heading into this match, uh, there, look, there had been uh, a creative rut that the WWE had seemed to be in. Lots of criticism, lots of complaints from the fan base. Ratings were down. WWE did not look to be heading into uh, a good direction. Um, Roman Reigns, the babyface that they want to keep pushing, uh, not getting over in the way they want. Sheamus seemed to be a, a half-baked heel, just kind of thrown into the mix uh, at Survivor Series to kind of change things up a little bit and maybe take the Money in the Bank briefcase out of play. But really, it seemed like heading towards the Royal Rumble and the the lengthy road to WrestleMania, uh, lots of lots of things just thrown up in the air. Lots of. Uh, uncertainty as far as things were going and i think as we we got through tlc and through raw things started to to show a little a little bit more clarity um and and actually the wwe showed that when they put their mind to it uh they can actually create compelling programming that their fan base can get into so um so once again you have roman reigns versus sheamus in the main event and you know, this, I, I think this was kind of a feud that nobody really cared that much about. Um, you know, since Sheamus returned after WrestleMania, uh, there hasn't really been a lot for him to do. You know, they, he has this new look, but there hasn't really been anything behind him uh, to push him to sort of that main event level. Even when he got the briefcase, uh, people looked at it as, you know, why? Uh, because there had been nothing, once again, to to kind of elevate him as he had earlier in his career. And Roman Reigns is another guy who, um, you know, we know that they want him to be the guy, uh, but there's this continued pushback from the fan base that they're not buying him. Uh, and I continue to say it goes back to the Royal Rumble uh, earlier this year where Daniel Bryan was involved. And there are some people who just will not let that go. They will not accept Roman Reigns uh, as an alternative because of how he won the Rumble, how he went to WrestleMania, and sort of this feeling that he was shoved down people's throat and it wasn't organic. So heading into this match, though, uh, what was your take on on how the feud had been built, uh, what you expected on the match, and then did the match ultimately deliver uh, what you wanted it to? Uh, Working backwards, I'll say the match delivered because – the only thing I was looking forward to between these two guys was a good, hard fight because I know they can do it. Keep Roman off the mic. Let him fight. Uh, I love watching Sheamus fight. You know, when he was the Money in the Bank uh, contract holder, they never did anything with him to, like, ready him to take that title. Even and they do that a lot with Money in the Bank briefcase holders. They don't – they just let him hover in the mid card until the, t- the, the time is right to strike, and then all of a sudden they're champion, and they hadn't really – they don't really do anything to help elevate them, like you said. Um, so I was just looking for a knockdown, dragout fight. And I would say that aside from his match going into Daniel Bryan and Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania last year, people don't really care about Roman Reigns' feuds at all. Um, you know, whether it was with Bray Wyatt or the, some of the matches he had with, with Seth Rollins even coming out of WrestleMania. It's just WWE was never placed to his strengths until I think – the end of TLC and on Raw. And I think they're trying to make him into a quote-unquote cover boy superstar, which involves a lot of mic time and press appearances and stuff like that. When that's not what's going to get Roman Reigns over, what's going to get him over is just straight-ahead violence, and that's what we saw. You know, I Will I like SmackDown this week? Will I like next week's TV programming or the Royal Rumble? I don't know. I really like TLC and Raw. And I liked what they did with him there. So this match, uh, I thought was really good. And um, I like, you know, the league uh, costing him the title. I don't know where Ambrose and the Usos were to help him out there. I thought they were going to come out and try to fend off the league. But I think Sheamus and Roman Reigns did a really good job in that main event. And again, Sheamus, when he's put up against other tough bruisers like himself, like a Cesaro or a Barrett or something like that, yeah, you know he's a really hard fighter, and especially with his uh, his skin complexion, you, 
bruises and welts and blood show up like instantly. He's like an old, like battle damage He-Man action figure. You know? <laughs> it, like it, you instantly see the damage done, and it, I think it really adds to sort of his fight persona. Um, so I enjoyed the main event, and then of course really enjoyed what came after the main event with the Triple H beatdown. Yeah, uh, we I have talked about this previously on 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 the show, which is that the way that they had been kind of setting up Roman Reigns was almost like uh, a, just another John Cena, like John Cena two point uh, just just with a different look. The way that they had written for him, uh, but, uh, you can't. It, he looks like I mean, Cena's a, like a handsome guy, yes, but but. Reigns looks like he comes off the cover of a romance novel, you know. Yeah, he, he, he looks definitely like, does. Like something with like a pirate theme, right? Like <laughs> he he's not going to be the same type of hero, and it's like he's not going to wear the colorful clothing. He's not even going to have the same outreach with kids, you know. Even if they try to make him into that, so I think a lot of the problems comes, yeah, with pushing him to try to be Cena, especially now that Cena is gone uh, for this, you know, two month gap. Um, when they should be, you know, playing into his strengths. And I think it does a disservice to a lot of the main eventers and even someone like the Intercontinental title scene keep bringing up legends of the past, you know. Is he the next rock? Is he the next Stone Cold? It's like, well, no, he can't be. They have to make him into what he is now. And they can't keep trying to give him these scripted promos and, and, and things that really highlight his flaws. They need to play into his strengths. And if they can just do that starting now they might have a really good chance of giving him some momentum going forward into wrestlemania whatever his program is going to be but also the intercontinental title scene i think it it's a disservice when jbl goes on and on about the old great what a, a disgrace ambrose is uh because of the old greats like randy savage and Shawn michaels and all this stuff um when you should really just focus on the players now and let that program help build the belt um, I think looking back too much it kind of hurts the business a little bit. Yeah, you have to let them be able to stand on their own a little bit, and and look, and when especially when they don't have any momentum, uh, the comparisons are really stark uh, at, at that point in time. You know, when when you're when you're having these these guys who are still trying to find their footing or still trying to be established, and yet you're comparing them with somebody like Shawn Michaels or anything, those guys are in the Hall of Fame. And these are guys who are just just still trying to find their way, and and creative doesn't always do uh, do them any favors. So when you're looking at them in in that comparison, yeah, they come off looking uh, subpar because I mean, they're I can, not on that level. I could list a ton of Intercontinental champions that don't uh, spotlight that belt too well. You know, you know, <laughs> you know, you can look back and and showcase the Jerichos, but you know, then there's the Mounties, and you know, taking nothing away. But, you know, there were a lot of uh, bad gimmicks held that title as well. Um, and so, yeah, the, the more you talk about the past, the more we think about the past. And like while we're watching the show now <laughs> and anything that just sort of takes us out of it and makes us, you know, pine for you know, old nostalgia, I don't think is too much is, is a really good thing. But Yeah. And that's and, you know, and that's one of the things I, I've always I found to be a problem with with their programming now is that. When you're you're not firing on all cylinders, when you're kind of coasting along, when you're kind of just hoping that the fans go along with it because that's that's their habit, that's what they always do. You have something like the WWE Network like at your disposal. So when you watch, when you go back, yeah, and you watch the old stuff, you watch the stuff like when it was really good, and then you watch something now, you can look at it very clearly and say, nah, they're not cutting the mustard right now because it's not it's not as 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 solid a product as it once was. And I think they have to battle against that. You know, for all they for all they talk all the time about how their competition is all of entertainment, um, you have to remember that all of entertainment is – there's a lot of content out there right now. There's a lot of content out there right now. It's easy to consume. It's easy to find and get to. So if you're watching something that isn't doing it for you, you can very quickly turn it off and go find something else. Uh, and, and that's a problem with them with their own company, their own content uh, with, with the network. And it's just a problem with them competing against other content. Um, but yeah, look, I, I agree with you on on the the, the John Cena point. Like, I, I think that the way that Roman Reigns has been set up with these scripted promos, trying to make him cutesy, kind of these uh, these goofy kind of analogies and insults that he throws up, 
that's not him. Uh, and no one has ever really believed that it's him. You know, you hear all the time from people who have had a chance to interact or talk with Roman Reigns or when Roman Reigns gets to do interviews where he's just himself, this incredible personality that he has. Uh, that that he's he's very easy to kind of uh, to stomach, uh, so to speak, and they don't really showcase any of that by trying to kind of wedge him into this box by trying to make him this vision that they want him to be, uh, rather than as you say, letting him be his own thing, letting him stand on his own and be Roman Reigns. Um, and look, yeah, because that because that tater tots promo, first of all, it wasn't good for anyone, like no. anyone saying that, <laughs> but that was a Cena line. Yes. Right. Would you agree? Like that was something that Cena would say and get a better reaction out of in the end um, and not even probably wouldn't have even had to repeat the line tater tots over and over again to get the crowd chanting it. They would have just done it. That's the Cena line. And that's what you're talking about, about them trying to mold him into this all rounder when he's not, you know, he's he's not good for that. He's 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 very specific at what he can do and do well. And that's what they need to lean into. Yeah, the, I mean, look, his strength is being dark and mysterious. Uh, like, like that's one of the things that that sh- they've should have been uh, throwing behind him this entire time, rather than yeah, giving him my time where he's not very good at it, especially live and in the ring. If you want to pre-tape stuff, I can understand. And look, I I know that they want to get guys in the ring. They want them to cut these long promos. They want to have them try and connect with the fans rather than just do stuff uh, that's pre-taped. But if it's not helping him if it's only really hurting him in the eyes of the fan base how is that beneficial to anyone involved uh it's not you know you're you're setting him up for failure and then when the the audience doesn't react in the way you want they just kind of throw up their hands and they're like oh i don't know what the fuck happened uh so yeah, i mean yeah i think i liked the tlc main event i thought they both did a great job i thought some of the spots were pretty impressive you know it's hard to follow you know anything resembling the ladder match that opened the show but i think they they brought it with the violence and i think you know this is the closest fans have been behind reigns now i wouldn't say that leading into tlc but post tlc perhaps the since back in the shield maybe yeah. right? because remember two years in a row at the rumble fans booed quote unquote, not Daniel Bryan, whoever the, filled that spot. Uh, one year it was Batista, uh, you know, and that's when Reigns was the next best thing to Daniel Bryan because he was taking out the guy who was who was winning that nobody wanted to win. Yeah, poor, and he poor was, and he was still, poor and he was still in Shield. Oh, man. There. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and again, this is all booking, too, right? This is all about how for two years in a row, Daniel Bryan was booked. Yes. And and I think Monday on Raw showed that even the most cynical fan, well, yeah, there's still going to be haters and naysayers out there who didn't even enjoy Raw, which I don't understand because I'm not a huge Roman Reigns fan, but I really love Raw. Um, I think that shows that just what good booking can actually do and good storytelling can do can turn you around. Um, so, yeah, and then last year at, at the Rumble, Reigns was the not Daniel Bryan, and he got booed. So now with no Daniel Bryan around, there's no not, you know, there's really no excuse for that. It's they really just have to build Reigns on his own. Um, but yeah, I, I think they really delivered well. And I think the um, this is what I think. And I'll I'll just step into Raw here a little bit if you don't mind. Go is ahead. that um, they did the storyline and was it a desperate move to pull in Hunter and then Steph and then Vince? Yeah, I mean the backs against the wall. Their competition is right now our disinterest. Uh, and they want to bring us back in. So they're going to kind of do a little stone cold, uh, put him up against all the authority, including Vince, the final boss. And if they had done this story the way they had been doing stories recently, Triple H, maybe the, tr- the beat down on Triple H would have come on Raw. Not after the match at TLC, but on Raw the next night. Maybe it would have just been a spear. Maybe it wouldn't have been the huge chair shots elbow drop on the table, powerbomb thing, maybe just one spear or a Superman punch. Then next week he confronts Stephanie and she slaps him. Then next week, the week after, Vince is going to come in. But then Vince doesn't even come in until the final segment. You know, you see what I'm saying? Like they condensed this story into one episode where normally they would have drawn it out as much as possible, but they gave us this instant story 
with a huge title win right at the end of it. And that's what made it feel like the Raws of old. We yeah. do this really quick storyline like that. I mean, you know, the days when like Kane would win the title from Stone Cold in a first blood match, the pay-per-view, and then Stone Cold would win it back the next night, you know, um, stuff like that. Yeah, no, I, I think I would agree because what with, with the end of TLC heading into Raw, uh, what it did was it threw predictability into the mix, unpredictability into the mix. Um, for for too long, it, everything has very much been by the numbers. You could sit there and lay it out, like what's going to happen, and see it coming. And you know, uh, predictability, I don't, I don't think is always a fair knock. You know, I, I think sometimes it should be about you know more about the journey than than the destination. But when the journey isn't all that exciting, then you have a real problem. Uh, I, I think here, you know, people didn't expect the end of TLC. Uh, and then as a result, people didn't expect uh, what was then going to happen on, on Raw. And I, and I think that fed into people's interest now. Their curiosity was peaked. They said, hmm, let's see where this is going to go. Uh, and, and, and as a result, look, their ratings went up on, on Monday Night for Raw. Yeah, exactly. Uh, for, right. for the first time in a while. They've been, they've been trending uh, significantly downward, I think, with one where it kind of just leveled off. But th- it's been a trend downward. And here, people looked at it and said, hmm, I didn't expect this. Well, now let's see what they're going to do. And I think that's that's when Raw has always been at its best, when you can't see it coming, when you don't know what's going to happen, when you go into a show every week and it's must-see because you don't know what they're going to show you rather than these weeks where you're like, okay, they're just going to take these four guys from each side, they're going to throw them into an eight-man tag, and that's how they'll build that feud. And I'll watch the New Day fight this tag team for the third week in a row. And, you know, so so as a result, there was there was a little bit of a sense of freshness here. Oh, oh they're, they're doing something a little bit different. They're doing something a little bit new. And as a result, they benefited from it. And because they were telling such a full story and a quick story, they were able to fill these, man, these three hours. That's another thing that's killing the programming and the journey are these three hours to where very little happens and you see the same matches over and over again. And that includes SmackDown, which I don't know exactly aside from commentary changes, you know, there are supposedly changes coming when it shifts over to USA, but will it be enough of a change to make that a vital show to watch again? Um, Cause you know, at this point I don't even care about SmackDown spoilers because it's so inconsequential to the overall storyline. Um, but yeah, so yeah, unpredictability definitely, and I think you can't also overstate the just the presence of of Vince McMahon. He is so good when in that character, and him at ringside at the end during that match was so great. His reactions, his timing, everything. That ref pull was amazing. Um, is it a last ditch effort to bring in him? Yes, of course. Um, you can't go beyond him at this point, and that speaks to the WWE's failure overall to build up names, you know, and now with Rollins out and Cena gone, you know, and they find themselves again with just a huge mid card that they never built. Um, but it really worked. I don't know what's going to happen going forward, but it sure worked on Monday. Yeah, uh, you know, go, going back to the TLC match, uh, you know, this was – I was interested because uh, I think when it comes to Sheamus, as you mentioned, styles help make his match. Um, You know, you're you're not always going to get a a solid match out of him depending on who he's he's squared off. He'll try. He'll work really hard. It's just sometimes it doesn't always click. But, yeah, when you have kind of two brutes in the ring together just beating the hell out of each other, that makes it interesting. And, you know, so as a result – we did. We got a physical match, and as you mentioned, Sheamus's pale body <laughs> uh, is, is a is an asset in in a match like this. It's a <laughs> glorious canvas for the violence, and he, I I know going into every match, he's going to hurt himself. Like he will try. He's he's stiff. He's a tough guy in that yeah. ring, and he's going to hurt the other guy too. Like he hits hard. Um, so that's what I can look forward to with the Sheamus match. His persona, heel, or I prefer heel to his face character most definitely. But um, it's yeah, it doesn't really get a rise out of me either way. Um, I think he's he's he. People don't give him enough credit on the mic. I think he's pretty good. But yeah, again, um, 
I really like the League of Nations stable, though. I thought that was an interesting idea. I don't know where it stands now that they've already kind of crumbled within three weeks. Uh, I mean, there's going to be a rematch, I'm sure. But um, so I like that. Uh, I I know a lot of people were wondering when all these people from actual, you know, European countries were going to unite. It, they seem to tease it for like on and off for a year uh, until now. But yeah, so the man, I really like that Superman punch off the ladder and then Seamus into the table. I thought that was really good. <laughs> yeah, no, I, they had some really good spots and lots of plunder throughout. I mean, they, if there was if there was a table or a chair or a ladder around, they made sure to wreck it. Um, and and yeah, and and I thought there were some really good spots throughout. And look. They heading into this look. They're in a tough market as it is. They're in Boston. Uh, Boston. Those Northeast markets are tough. Uh, New York, Philly, Boston. They are tough. And if I they grew up in New York, and I grew up going to MSG shows, so I know. Yeah, yeah, I know tough. How tough Chicago, they tough. These are tough towns that if if they're not getting good product, they will let you know about it. And right out of the gate. There was seen a chance early on. So watching this match, I'm like, oh, they got a they got an uphill climb as it is. And the fascinating part is, once again, you tell a good story, you'll get the crowd behind you. And over the course of this match, they were able to turn this crowd from where they started to where the show ended up. And that is a testament to to that what good booking can do, what good character work can do, what building a match properly can do, what what building sympathy for a character can do. Uh, all things that they never that they it seems like they've forgotten how to do in recent months, where they just want to continue to kind of do the same thing. You know, the it's very the, the one of the keys to the hero's journey is that the hero has to overcome something. There has to be obstacles thrown in their way so that every even when they get to take one step forward, it seems like they get knocked back two steps and you're with them on that. You go, oh, that sucks. And you're with them on that journey as once again, they try to cross that barrier and keep climbing up the mountain. And they, they've forgotten how to do that recently. They just want to keep having guys just climb up the mountain without any problem. And there's no there's no sympathy there for them. So here, you know, you have Roman Reigns, who who's always a bridesmaid, never the bride. Uh, even when he was the bride, it was for five minutes and fifteen seconds before he he was moved on his way. And you know, here they have it again. You bring out the League of Nations to interfere, and and once again cost him a chance at the title. So you have Sheamus retain at TLC, and look, the League of Nations, I'm not crazy about because uh, while it. On paper, it may seem like an interesting concept. I think the execution has just been poor. Uh, just been four guys they threw together uh, that don't really have any connection whatsoever. So to kind of put them in a faction or a stable, it, it just feels odd. It feels like, well, we didn't know what to do with these four guys, so so here they are. Um, you know, and, and there's nothing that would say that like Alberto Del Rio or Bad News Barrett uh, or, or Rusev would have any of these guys back at any point in time. Because other than the fact that they're from Europe, there's really no connection there. Um, but yeah, so you have the League of Nations interfere. You have uh, uh, Roman Reigns screwed once again. And people kind of feel that. They look at it and they go, ah, oh, man, this again. Like, you know, it's the Daniel Bryan situation kind of all over again. Like, oh, they're just, they're going to keep screwing this. And even if you don't like Roman Reigns, you can at least feel for the character. It still it still invokes some type of emotion from within you because you can look at that and say, well, that's not right. You know, it, it, it speaks to your sense of justice. Um, so the, here in the aftermath of this TLC match, that's where they really caught lightning in a bottle here. That's where they hit the spark because that's what Roman Reigns needed to do. He needed to get pissed and he needed to snap. And he needed to show some type of passion, some type of fire, something that felt real that people could connect to. Because as you, as we mentioned, all of this scripted stuff and trying to, to fit him inside this box and, and, and have him perceived in a certain way wasn't really working for him because it felt inauthentic. It didn't feel like him. This feels like him. This felt like a guy who had enough and fuck it, he's going to take it all out. And people get behind that. They go, yeah, I'm all behind. Take it to the man. And 
And that's where they started to really work with Roman Reigns in the right way. And you saw this Boston crowd by the end of the night was cheering for Roman Reigns. When well, they had a thank you Roman chant. Thing. Yes. During the, right during the, the point where you thought he was leaving Triple H alone and then he came back for one last hit. But uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, like you said, good storytelling can make you cheer for, even if it's momentarily, someone you don't like. You know, like it can get you behind someone. Like Roman's not the easiest guy to sell as an underdog because of his look and even because he comes out like looking like he's fully armored you know <laughs> uh well like compare him to Seamus who's like practically naked uh with all these welts and then Seamus I mean then the Roman Reigns on. he's come out like almost completely covered with clothing and like hard clothing uh, what's the the chest pounding the the beats of the whatever that uh Seamus does uh, when he hits you on the chest oh, for yeah, 10 yeah. times like he's hitting him on this like Kevlar vest I'm like oh come on you know but yeah, good, and and you can argue too whether or not Triple H deserved that beating or not. I mean, he's sometimes a babyface, sometimes a heel character. He throws wrenches and obstacles in your path that most definitely makes it difficult for you. But he didn't come out and like screw uh, Roman Reigns out of the title that night himself. But he still got the brunt of this massive beating that just went on and on. Um, and I think the fans really, I think the fans really sided with how maybe even unwarranted the beating was. <laughs> <laughs> I think they kind of liked the fact that it was overkill, uh, and that maybe tri- that maybe Hunter didn't even deserve half of what he was getting. All things considered, and all the ways you can interfere in a match. Yeah, he was um, just guilty by association. And like <laughs> in many he, ways it was, night. it was like he was taking a beating for maybe everything he'd done over the past couple years. Yeah. Like not not even just to Roman Reigns. It was just like they wanted to see this happen. And the fact that Triple H, you know, people rag on him, but he's still a huge star. And then he is, you know, in the pecking order very high. And so this was happening to him, uh, even though, you know, he wears a suit more now than he does tights. But it would also signal that this people were also probably thinking at the same time, this is going to get him back in the ring, too, at some point. You know, yeah, that's what this well is leading like... to. That's what <laughs> it's most likely leading to. So. Yeah, I mean, I I think um, I look, I I think yeah, he's he's guilty by association uh, in a number of ways. You know, he takes out all the he he, he pummels uh, Alberto Del Rio and he pummels Rusev and he pummels Sheamus to that point. And here comes Triple H. And yeah, look, the, the Triple H character right now is extremely confusing. I think for a lot of people because yeah, you know, and, and I and I don't think that they fully have have understood that to this point because you know. He can come out on on Raw as part of the authority, and people boo him for for being you know for operating uh, based off of what's best for business. But then two nights later, uh, you, you watch NXT and you know that he's responsible for that, and, and you and you and you think finally of him there. So you know, it, or, or you see him on Breaking Ground giving great news to Sasha Banks and Becky yeah, and uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> Bailey, right? Like being and making them cry with tears of joy because he's so nice and like. They, you know, they like him a lot, and even he's even babyface within storyline on Raw too. Whenever he like shames the heel champ, which he was doing to Randy Orton at one point, and then of course famously with Seth Rollins all the yes. time. Um, yeah, so they go back and forth all the time. Yeah, and and I think and you know and and look and, and as a result, it, it becomes difficult. But I, I think there's. I think people embrace the the Triple H one, the, the Triple H beating one because here you got to see Roman Reigns kind of unleash really what he he was best known for uh, as a member of the shield like that that was his strength as as a member of the shield which was you know just be the last guy let let Rollins and Ambrose do all the work and you come in at the end and just wreck everything like you know deliver the the, the brunt of the beating at the end put it over the top and that's what people pop for that's what people went crazy for so yeah i think that was part of it and and i think the triple h build up a kind of all of the awful things that they've done over months and months you know, it kind of fed into this. But I think it also speaks to uh, to one of the other problems that the WWE still needs to try and address up and down the rest of the card, which is getting heat on other people. Triple H has a heat because of the way he acts in, in, in certain situations, but I don't think that they they work hard enough to get real heat on their heels in a way that when something like this happens... It pops the crowd because they want to see that 
talent get their comeuppance. They want to see somebody go and kick their ass. And that's what they're going to pay money for. That's what they're going to tune in to watch. And, you know, maybe the heel escapes. Maybe, you know, they use some type of nefarious means to, to still get one over. But at some point... The culmination is going to be that they're going to get what they deserve. And I think that they continue to to go up and down with some of their bookings and their talents that as a result, we don't get too much of this. We don't get too much of talent getting what they deserve. And as a result, that's kind of why uh, a lot of their performers feel flat in the way that they're, the audience responds to them. Well, the, yeah, the 50-50 booking also doesn't help anyone, which uh... – which, again, we can talk about the Wyatts and Team ECW, and I think I really like the fact that the Wyatts were able to dominate For all once. these matches <laughs> and, win, and win and win them, not have to split the victories. But can you? I want to ask you, can you imagine, and this was something I did lament, aside from the fact that I really like Seth Rollins as a performer and I wish him all the luck in the world with his rehab, and I want him back as soon as possible, but not too soon that he hurts himself. But uh, can you imagine if that beatdown, though, was done to Seth Rollins? Like, that would have been Seth Rollins' comeuppance and him getting what he deserved. Like, maybe that was a plan at some point because, you know, with Reigns was supposed to face Rollins. And that was a feud, a Reigns feud I was actually in on. You know, I was in for Reigns versus Rollins because of the history. Um, it didn't wind up happening. But I think, yeah, like... Seth Rollins will come back. Maybe he'll even come back as a baby face because people will miss him at that point and his athleticism. But yeah, that was the cu- that was the payoff we didn't get for Seth Rollins' title reign. Like that's what should have come at the end of it. That type of beating. Yeah, um, and 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 I never uh, I never got the sense that we would have gotten it though. Um, you know, I I, I think well, you're right. You're right. That's yeah. why I'm like, just imagine if that had happened. Like, oh no, was, it, it, by the, by that would have been the perfect exclamation point to his heel run. As oh, absolutely. I, I I think by you know by the if you just go by the book, um, you know that's Seth Rollins had been put in a position where that's what you wanted to see happen to him. Eventually, the problem was that even yeah, the way that they had had, had set him up. Uh, kind of up and down where, you know, he's he's whiny, he's crying, he's, he's trying to be tough at times. It was so inconsistent that I don't know that it would have – maybe it would have hit as much as well as the Triple H because Triple H is as inconsistent as anybody else. But, but yeah, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing that you would want to have from a heel. You know, you want the people – to hate that person so much, they're so dastardly, they're so uh, conniving, they're so scheming that, yeah, when they do get their comeuppance, it feels good. It feels like justice has been has been doled out, and I think that's what we finally got here with Roman Reigns. So you get this at the end of TLC, you have him just wreck everything, and then the next night in Raw, you have this confrontation with Vince McMahon. Uh, first the confrontation with Stephanie, but then a confrontation with Vince McMahon, where you know, once again, the the strength of this is kind of having him be rebellious, having him stand against the machine. So as uh, Vince McMahon is demanding apologies from him, he is looking in the face of this guy who has made many uh, cower before him and, and standing up for himself. So I think that also helps build the character. And look, it, it's not lost on me the fact that Raw took place in Philly which is where the Royal Rumble happened, where he got famously booed. So to, to be able to have that crowd turn over the course of a, a year, um, but, but in two nights to work Boston and Philly and get both of those crowds to now embrace Roman Reigns uh, by having Roman Reigns essentially destroy the League of Nations uh, in a number of ways and come out as the new world heavyweight champion and be cheered for it. Once again, that just goes to show if you do the things that you're supposed to do correctly and you do them well, people will get behind it even if they don't like the guy. Yeah, exactly. So uh, so ultimately, that that's where we wind up. Uh, with uh, post TLC uh, and through Raw is with Roman Reigns, your new WWE World Heavyweight Champion, and uh, essentially now taking on all of the authority, be it Triple H, be it Stephanie, be it uh, Vince McMahon. He is now stuck it to the man, and now you know they're going to make his life a living hell uh, as we move forward. Where that leads us through the Royal Rumble and WrestleMania, 
I don't know. Are we going to get another rematch with Brock Lesnar in the main event? Uh, it feels like we already kind of did that um, last year uh, as far as like Brock Lesnar being the guy uh, for the authority. And I don't know that people want to see Brock Lesnar in that role, um, you know, as kind of being uh, under the control of the authority uh, merely for the, the sake of getting the title off of Roman Reigns. It's it's interesting because um, I don't know. I'm assuming going forward that Sheamus will fight him at the Rumble, maybe, and uh, or have his rematch earlier. I don't know what the Rumble holds holds as far as um, a main event goes. But where Roman stands as champ after that is kind of like: Will he be champ going into WrestleMania, or will he have a different match? Will he have a Triple H match, right? Uh, or will someone else have the title by then? Because Whoever wins that rumble, they're either going to be – it's either going to be the guy who faces Reigns or it'll just be something completely different depending on who they see as champion at that point. Uh, because I think we're beyond the point now of titles changing between rumble and mania. Like whoever's get the champ coming out of the rumble is most guaranteed to be the champ going into mania because people want to have that main event set in their head. Um, so yeah, like – Here's my dream is that they uh, – Brock, uh, Brock Lesnar aside, uh, they bring in The Undertaker to take out Reigns. <laughs> and then he takes the title and can go in as champ, and then that will be his retirement match. And that can open up a whole other you know, arena for him because I don't even know who Undertaker's facing at Mania at this point. Um, but yeah, do they strip him of the title or does he just lose it in a match? You know, I don't know what's – like – I still don't know what the next few months hold, but I am more optimistic now coming out of Monday's Raw. That could change in a week, but right now <laughs> I feel more confident. Uh, I still can't book Mania in my head, um, but I do have more confidence. Yeah, I'm much more curious uh, to see where they're going next. And, and once again, that that leads to that air of unpredictability that I think is is a is a is a good thing for them to have going into the Royal Rumble and having uncertainty as to who is going to walk out the Royal Rumble winner, that's a benefit as opposed to when you kind of watch it and it feels like so matter of fact, like, oh, well, it's, it's got to be this guy because it's clearly uh, the direction that you're moving in. I think that they're I, – I, th I think also uh, having a, a lack of – a lack of credible main eventers – um, that's yeah. You know, makes it also slightly problematic for them, um, because there are very few people you can look at and say they're going to main event WrestleMania 32 in Dallas in front of what they want to be a hundred something thousand people in there. Uh, it, it's not. Look, it's not going to be Sheamus. Uh, I can tell you that. Yeah. I can tell you that I, for sure. Nobody's I mean, buying I'm, a ticket going. I want to see Sheamus in the main event of WrestleMania. God, it, it's you have to think too. It's like, would the Undertaker retirement match be going on last, and would there actually have to be a the title as the main event this year? Uh, because they could have the title be completely separate, and then just have marquee matches that overshadow the title match. You know, if the idea is to, you know, sell out this huge stadium, uh, yeah, I don't know if they're a lot of their plans are seem to be falling apart. Uh, you know, things that the people were thinking in the summer about The Rock and Ronda Rousey and you know, even Stone Cold at some point, they seem to have all fallen by the wayside. And uh, now it just sort of like we're stuck with our locker room today. And you're like, oh, you know, we've got Undertaker and Brock, but, you know, who else? Cena. Um, that's it. You hope Rollins will be back in time, but I don't think so. Um, Say, so yeah, how do you build a super card out of the existing materials? Um, I don't know. I, I don't have the answer to that one, but... Um, yeah, and I don't know either because especially when the existing materials are are talent that you haven't really done anything with to make matter too much, uh, and and you know, and look, you can we can look at the rest of the TLC card and you see it. You know, we we predicted the matches last week and it it all felt very matter of fact. It all felt very predictable as far as how this card was going to go because you look at something like a U.S. title match, uh, which is you know the chairs match between Alberto Del Rio and Jack Swagger. I think people forgot that Jack Swagger even worked there uh, heading into this pay-per-view. So I forgot his whole move set. Yeah, so, uh, I, I, I was like, oh, what does he do again? That's right. You know, yeah, so when they're all of a sudden he's competing for the U.S. title, it doesn't feel 
Right. Like, I'm watching this, and look, I like Jack Swagger, and Jack Swagger had never been hotter, even when he was the world champion uh, years ago, had never been hotter than he was probably about this time last year, a little bit earlier, uh, a little bit later uh, than, than this time last year, when he had kind of this mini feud with Rusev, and and Rusev was still undefeated and, and kind of this foreign power, and here he was talking down about America, and Jack Swagger shows up and is trying to defend the honor of America. And I thought that was the, the best that they had with Jack Swagger at that point. And then after that, they did nothing with it. So you bring him back after he's not doing anything for a while. And you watch that match. And what does it matter? Like, it's just another match on the card. Uh, uh, that just, just makes me – it just makes me sad when you bring up Rusev like that because he – could have been someone we could be booking right now for Mania in our heads. Like yes. if they had kept him as a monster and they had kept him with Lana and not uh, diluted him with that horrible love triangle or quadrangle story that they had going on that just worked to sort of wreck his demolisher persona, he could have had such a, a strong standing right now going yeah. into Mania again. Yeah, um, because you look at him right now and you go, I don't know what the hell you do with him. Like I don't know where where you go with him. I think, I think they're – I, I like what they're trying to do with Lana right now, which is get her more involved, um, make her a little bit more sneaky, a little bit more Weasley, uh, a little bit more uh, interactive as far as the matches are concerned to kind of help uh, Rusev. And yeah, it takes a little bit away from him, but kind of being this monster, but it's going to get some heel on. It's going to get some heel heat on them because now he's winning through cheating, uh, using her. So now you change the chance of We Want Lana into people starting to not like that character because of what she's doing. So, yeah, I, I, I like that change a little bit. But once again, because of the damage that has been done, I don't know what you do with them moving forward. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I do wish... Uh, again, I just pine for what they used to be. So there's no going back at this point. I wish she was on the mic more, and she's still arm candy. That's the thing. That's what she got reduced to in the whole uh, aftermath of his Cena feud uh, is that you know she just became someone who smiled at ringside or even from the stage, and she's kind of doing that now. Now they have her cheating, which is a step in the right direction, but she was so good on the mic, and she's not no longer his spokesperson anymore. She's his his fiance, you know, so now she has to sort of dote at ringside instead of being there to, as his advocate and like, you know, talking him up. Um, so, and, you know, she even still dresses almost the same way she did when she was with Ziggler. She didn't go back to her power suits or anything like that. Um, but yeah, I don't know what you, you do with him. I don't know if, yeah, the whole mid card, there's a whole bunch of people I don't know what you do with. I mean, I know a lot of them are going to wind up in some sort of ladder match or, you know, yeah. at, le at least eight or ten of them are going to Yeah, let's branded. take 12 guys and put them in a ladder match because um, we don't know what else to do with them. And, yeah, and you, and, you know, and that's the other, you, the, you know, we bring up Rusev, Rusev versus Ryback. Who cares? Like, there's, there's no, there's nothing behind this other than, you know, I, I guess you kind of have this, you know, these, these, collisions with with lana and as a result that's supposed to make some type of uh substance <laughs> out of this match but you know ryback is a guy that you had the intercontinental championship on lost it to kevin owens and now he's in no man's land he's just out in in nowhere and i'm not the biggest ryback fan i would much rather they just throw ryback so together again uh, because at least it's it's giving those two guys something to do but Here's here's two guys in a match that no one gives a shit about, and as a, and you throw it on the pay per view, and you watch it, and you're like, ah, I think I'll make myself a sandwich while this match is on because you're not invested in it in any way, shape, or form. Well, it also goes to stand that you don't believe Ryback can win at this point. I, I you know, I I'm not a Ryback fan at all, heel or face. I just wasn't a fan um, from the get go, and. I like him on podcasts. You know, he's really nice. He's really personable. He comes off really well. I like his positivity and his belief in the secret and how he's motivated him to bring himself back into the business so many times and through injuries and gimmick changes and stuff like that. I think it's it's really good. And, and he also goes on about how he's spoken up a lot of times saying, like, I'm ready to fill the main event spot whenever you need me. If someone goes down, I'm your next Cena. You know, words to that, to that effect. Uh, but he – he – God, I mean, maybe he's like Vince's vision of a hero, but he looks like a monster. He looks yeah. like he's his he's super built, but abnormally so that you can't get behind him. And he looks his face is so snarling and 
I, you know, he's had like eye problems and I don't know. It's just, he's like a big bulging, oozing mess a lot of the time. And so <laughs> for him to be anything like in the category of being a superhero feels off to me. Um, so yeah, I never get behind a Ryback match. Um, yeah. He's, I mean, he's a guy that they looked at and they go, this is, we like his look. We think this is the look of a guy. I, who I, be man, I, I don't need people to be Daniel Bryan size, but I don't need people to be Ryback shaped either. Like, I don't know. <laughs> It's it's just off putting. Well, see, and and the and look, the guy tries. I'm not going to say it doesn't. No, try. he does. He does. Um, yeah. But but the the problem with somebody like Ryback is that right now, um, work rate is a big deal. You know, when you the 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 thing is that they they continue to see their audience in a certain way, and I'm not just talking about like the IWC or the hardcore fans. I'm talking about just everyone that you know when you start to smarten your fan base up a little bit then they start to demand a lot more out of your product. And you can't go back to kind of the same things that you used to do where you kind of insult their intelligence a little bit. And I think work rate right now means a lot. People want these athletic matches. They want athletic contests. They want something that's exciting to watch. And and they, you know, they want to be able to go and say, this is awesome and chant that out uh, because of what they're witnessing in the ring. So when you have somebody that's just kind of plotting uh, like like Ryback and just slows everything down. Uh, it's tough for people to accept that. You know, it's why they kind of turned on the Big Show uh, as much as the Big Show turned on them back and forth. But it's just that that style seems to be from another era, and it hasn't. They haven't really figured out how to make that work now, other than kind of what. Paul Heyman used to do an ECW with like 911 and characters like that, you know, you know, when he brought in Sid Vicious, is just make them monsters. Just make them monsters who destroy things. And then maybe along the way, you kind of have some David versus Goliath scenario or have them kind of stand in the back as like a bodyguard or an enforcer rather than try to push them, yeah, as you mentioned, as this kind of hero because I think they're ill-fitted towards that character. I've been watching wrestling since... Uh, late 80s maybe 86 mm-hmm. 87 um i miss squash matches i miss you know if you had ryback just for a few weeks come out and he'd be a lot more palatable if we just watched him if you had to fill three hours and you put him in with a with a local talent who he just squashes and then you get your ryback fix and then there he goes and then he doesn't have to lose all the time and then he doesn't have to even be in a storyline all the time you know he could just be there um because not a, you know, I, I come from an era where uh, my favorite wrestlers who I ever watched, I've already seen Ryback wrestle five times more than them. You know, we're in an era now where you see these guys so much with all the WWE programming going forward. Maybe the, my, some of my favorite wrestlers of all time I saw wrestle half uh, or two dozen times. Well, that's you know, that's nothing compared to how many times I've seen Ryback wrestle or Ziggler or anybody. You know, we see them so often. Um, and they always have to be in some sort of feud, and then you wind up seeing the same match over and over again, and it just becomes, you know, you, you just tune out. You get numb to everything. You know, you could take a gimmick like, uh, and, you know, we can we laugh about it now and see Nick and mock it, but, you know, the um, Funkadactyls and the whole... Um, uh, oh, the, the Funkasaurus whole, the, the, and, yeah, and the whole Funkasaurus, Yeah, the whole Funkasaurus gimmick, which I saw, and I was like, this is great. And then three weeks later, I'm like, I am over this because I'd already seen it so many times yeah. on all the WWE programming. They would roll it out and because they have to assume that somebody maybe missed Monday or missed Thursday or Friday, you know, and so they have to show it to you over and over again. Um, so you get worn out and Fandango and like anything that would have lasted for years in the past uh, now has such a short sh- uh, shelf life. Yeah, they're overexposed. It's, it's almost like they forgot that they're on TV um, because, you know, back before they had so much programming and so much content and so many hours to fill, they were just – they toured. They went from market to market, from city to city. And, yeah, they could put on the same match uh, every night because people hadn't seen it. You know, people in Dallas hadn't seen what people in Detroit had. People in Kansas City hadn't seen what people in Atlanta had, you know, because they, they didn't have the access. Now – it's a glo- It's globalized. They can see it anytime they want. So, so you have to constantly try and do something different. And I think, look, uh, I think I think there's a difference between watching Dolph Ziggler have a match all the time, um, where you're you're at least 
you at least have a good shot that you're going to see something new and different uh, than, than watching somebody like Ryback, who has a limited skill set, have the same match all the time. Because they do. They feel like the same match. And, uh, and, you know, and you've got to figure out how to, how to work around that. I think, I think they actually had something going with Ryback uh, not too long ago um, where I think it was with the Kevin Owens stuff where, like, they had him working on a body part. Uh, this was a reason that you had somebody smaller than Ryback getting over on Ryback. You know, they were working on his elbow. They were working on his knee. This makes sense to me rather than have – them try to go head to head to him but but yeah i think somebody like ryback look damaged and and you have to look at it and say oh how do you fix that somebody like rusev damaged jack swagger damaged alberto del rio came back nobody nobody really seems to have cared because they haven't done anything with him to get the audience to invest in him it was um, either on it was either on TLC or on Raw that they actually brought up him beating Cena because as soon as he beat Cena and Cena vanished they never, which they never addressed. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, they just didn't do since, anything. With since it. when did Cena not immediately come back to seek revenge after losing to like a Sabat kick? You know, like, yeah. th- why wasn't he on the next night at Raw? Why didn't he? You know, it was never explained. He just never showed up. Um, but then they also never, and then because of that, they never fully capitalized off of Del Rio's like huge, clean, you know, somewhat easy victory over Cena. Um, and then the whole thing with the Mex America thing went, you know, south really quick. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, think... look, they 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 have problems with with their with building their talent. Uh, period. Uh, you know, and and even even when we go to the opening of the TLC match, okay, this this triple threat this triple threat ladder match for the tag team titles between the New Day, the Lucha Dragons, and the Usos. You look at that. And you go, why do I care about the Lucha Dragons? Because they haven't done anything with them. You know, they, they, they come up, they, they might have a good match one week and get and score a win in a non-title match, and then they disappear for two weeks. And then they come back and you go, oh, yeah, that's right, I forgot they're in it for the title. So you have the New Day who's constantly on TV now to the point where you're like, they're, how, how long before they run these unicorn horns into the ground – um uh, and and they're squaring off against two teams that that don't really have anything going for them. The the Usos were were going for a while and you know they had they suffered an unfortunate injury and as a result they've been off of TV, but since they came back there's really been nothing to them other than like oh look yeah they're family with Roman Reigns. So while you have this match that is cool because there's all these crazy spots throughout, fans are getting into it. Um, you know, and, and the New Day is involved uh, as, as entertaining yet unheelish as they are. Uh, you still have a problem where you have four participants, four members of this match that people don't really have any reason to think have a chance at winning. The, uh, the New Day get, get the benefit of having being able to have their personalities out there, which, yeah. you know, has been a huge – which has been all, meant all the, the entire world to them. It's helped them get over and they're extremely entertaining. And back in the day, if you were, if you were drawing comparisons to something like Edge and Christian and, and the Hardys, they're Edge and Christian. They're the ones who get to be funny and still be heels and they come out and make fun of the local team and um, do all that stuff. And they're really good, whereas, you know, the other team, whoever it might be, can be the stoic, more serious – you know, let's go out there and win one because we're good um, type team. I think of the, the issue with uh, having the Luchas and the, uh, the Usos in one match, at least together, is the fact that both teams aren't, don't have personalities. And also when uh, bodies are flying around the ring, they can be indistinguishable from one another because one team are twins and the other team are masked. Um, so it, it all just sort of runs together. Uh, because it, in the heyday of the Hardys uh, and then the uh, Edge and Christian and the Dudleys, the Dudleys were, were distinguishable and they were, had personalities of their own. You know, so it was really just the Hardys who were kind of the quiet ones. Here you've got you know, um, four out of the, I would say six, but it's really four out of the seven because New Day is a triple threat, uh, who are quiet and, and don't yeah. get the mic time and are very talented in the ring and very athletic. Um, but yeah, it was kind of easy to sort of spot the New Day coming out on top here because they are the boisterous ones and they are the ones who are opening and closing the show these days uh, on a, any given Raw. You can see them come out first or you can see them come out last or both. 
and that's not the spot that either of the other teams are in. Uh, don't forget, though, that Callisto is a former World uh, Heavyweight Championship contender. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, thrown into thrown into a tournament and made it past the first round. So <laughs> thrown know, into a tournament where he, that, that no one knew why he was even in it, and yes, and didn't manage to get out of the first him round. And Ty, him and Titus as the sort of random half of the tag teams that aren't even tag team champions. Um, where it the was other just, we need, it was we need the another other, guy. <laughs> where the other member of the tag team just gets left in the lurch for no explained reason. No, not at all. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, other, that, uh, that Callisto spot though was insane. You know? Oh no, I, I I absolutely agree. The 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 uh, Salisa del Sol or, or whatever it's called uh, off the ladder or off a ladder through a ladder. Um, was pretty insane. And look, and that, that's why they stick these guys in the, in this match uh, because you have uh, Sin Cara and Kalisto and the Usos and who and, and Kofi Kingston uh, who can do these things, can kind of give these high spots that, that excite the crowd and kind of set the tone for the rest of the card. Uh, if there's one, look, if there's one problem that I took uh, from this match and it's it's constant and it, it just really stood out. Uh, for me in this match and, and once again I think it's just another one of those issues that, that they have with the product as a whole is that the commentary is uh, on, on matches like this is horrendous because Michael Cole cannot for the life of him ever sell any sort of damage that's going on and and I think this kind of feeds into their mindset of you know uh, we're trying to entertain you you know uh, this is it's not real we're just trying to entertain you um, and, and you know I, and I don't want to constantly go back to you know well, back in the day and, and the Jim Ross days and whatnot but when Jim Ross was on on commentary when something like this would happen he would sell it you would think these guys might have died of ringside um, with some of the spots that they were doing and here you know, Michael, th- these guys are putting their bodies on the line and, and awful things are happening to them in the match. And Michael Kill is just like, wow, isn't this amazing? This is incredible. And I'm like, this looks horrible. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, I, and I think it hurts. It hurts the talent and it hurts getting matches like this over because you should be feeling the pain a little bit. If a guy goes through a ladder, you should cringe. You should be like, oh, not, yeah. I mean, the yeah might come afterwards, but your initial reaction should be, ooh, that looked like it hurt. And the commentators never sell that action in that way anymore. And I think it hurts get get those things over. Yeah, I mean, again, we'd all love to have JR back, but I think he's spoken on his podcast a bunch about how he wouldn't even be allowed to do his style if he came back. No. If he came back, it, it, you know, there's too many things to plug. There's too many uh, thing. There's just too too many things other than what's going on in the ring that you need to talk about. And it's not like JBL and Cole are making those decisions, of course, but they have to talk about what somebody wrote on Twitter, you know, which was planned as part of the feud. You know, yeah. they have to talk about um, who's sponsoring the pay per view. They have to they have to do a little banter here and there, and occasionally get back to the the action in the ring. Not call the specifics. Not call working on a body part. Not you know selling any of the, the actual psychology involved in the match, but just returning to it every once in a while. If you notice, though, if you go back to Raw main event, which I do actually want to rewatch at some point, I believe they were calling that match. And whether it was because Vince wasn't in their ear and he was right at ringside or because Vince was involved in the match and that made it the match too, there was nothing else in the world you needed to be paying attention to except Vince McMahon at, at ringside in this match for the title. They were calling that match. They weren't going to other things. Um, so it was a, sort of a, uh, a big contrast to their usual uh, commentary style. Yeah, because when you when you make something sound important, it is important. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's the, just, people it's just buy that, it. They only sparingly make things sound important. They, yeah. they, they really pick and choose instead of like trying to make most or everything sound important. Yeah. Um, let's touch uh, really quickly on the two other matches we didn't get a, a chance to hit, which is the Divas title and Charlotte versus Paige, where Charlotte continues to sort of seep into this heel turn um, against Paige, who healed her prior uh, with, with her dad, uh, Ric Flair's interference. So now we just kind of add another heel in the mix uh, in the Divas division. I don't know that there's actually a face 
in the Divas division anymore other than uh, Becky Lynch. Um, Natalia. Yeah, she, she's it. Yeah, she's that's it. it. Natalia was for a little bit, but once again, she kind of disappeared. But really, you have a division that's filled with heel women and Becky Lynch. And technically, Charlotte hasn't made that full turn yet, right? Because Becky's still teaming with her and is unaware of the cheating that's going on within her, whatever the ashes are of PCB now, with Ric Flair cheating on uh, Charlotte's behalf and then helping them get wins. So at some point, Becky will make that turn, and then Charlotte will go more more heel, which is a role that better suits her, I think, than being a babyface, honestly. Um, and then, yeah, I, I don't know what they're going to do with Paige. They have to sort of take her out and put and reinsert her at some point and figure out if she's coming back as a heel or a babyface because – she her she's the one who kind of uh got left a bit in the lurch here because charlotte they kind of figured okay she's not working as a baby face we're going to turn her but we're going to turn her slowly in the middle of this feud she's already having with the established heel who is Paige. <laughs> uh so Paige is the one who they really have to sort of uh rejigger when she comes back and figure out how she fits in uh because right now i mean if you've got a working program that's going to be happening between Becky and Charlotte, that's fine. Uh, and as much as it pains me, if you're going to you know, hold off on Sasha Banks until WrestleMania, okay, because I'm a huge, huge uh, Sasha mark. Who isn't? And, <laughs> and like, she can get her mania moment, but in the interim, you're kind of like, ah, you know. Please, you know, just something. Just get... <laughs> In the very least, in the very least, she has not lost a match on the Raw roster. Uh, she lost a tag match once that uh, Naomi took the pin for, but she has not lost a match. Another one went to like some weird time limit draw because it was a beat the clock, but yes. she's beaten everyone. So hopefully that becomes a, a talking point once they decide to pull her into the, the title picture. Wasn't but, trying yeah. to pull her into any kind of picture. You know, I, th- that's the fun. I mean, look, Raw is in, I mean, Raw is in Philly. Uh, TLC's in Boston, her hometown. And she's not even on the card. And, you know. And and, you see you see that, too, because they added that pre-match, you know, hours before the show, which they usually do. They kind of, yeah. like, say, oh, and by the way, here's what's coming up first. But that's when they're like, oh, yeah, <laughs> people will probably <laughs> want to see Sasha Banks wrestle. So here it is. Yeah. And then uh, the other match, which we touched upon a little bit, which is the IC title, uh, Kevin Owens versus Dean Ambrose. This is the one match that actually surprised me um, because I didn't think that they were going to take the belt off of Kevin Owens this but then quickly. It, if, uh, if Ambrose hadn't won, it would have been a clean sweep for all the heels in the entire show. I, would, uh, so I, I think I would have been okay with that. <laughs> I would have been totally okay with that, but I don't think that's ever happened. Um, no, I, well, but then again, it all it all matters of it all matters as far as what do you consider Charlotte and Paige? Because no one knows yeah. who the hell's the face or the heel there anyway. Um, but but yeah, I mean, I I, I think that that Kevin Owens, look, Kevin Owens is always going to be fine because he has the personality and the charisma to kind of make right whatever whatever the creative might do against him. He's always going to be able to kind of find that heat. But I think once again, they need to find guys that they can take to the next level. They have a large mid card. They're incredibly bottom heavy right now, and they need to figure out how to elevate uh, talent, whether it's Owens or Ziggler or Ambrose, you know, or, or Del Rio. they have to figure out how to get these guys from where they are now to the next level so that we don't just have pay-per-views or special events where it feels like we're watching the same thing all over again. That it's not just Sheamus versus uh, John Cena for four months or Roman Reigns versus uh, Sheamus for three months. You know, it feels like there's a little bit of interchangeability the way that it used to be kind of when you had Guys like uh, Triple H and Stone Cold and The Rock and Kurt Angle and The Undertaker. You had lots of guys that you could kind of plug into that mix. Here it feels like, um, even before the injuries happened, here it felt like there were only a handful. Now they're down to maybe only like a couple. And they got to figure out how to kind of uh, make that bounty a little bit more plentiful for them to be able to, to create some more interesting main event scenarios when you're dealing with you know, guys who are still not there all the time, whether they're The Undertaker or Brock Lesnar, you got to figure out how to make it work with guys who are there all the time consistently. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's it's hard because they played it too safe for so long with Cena and they, you know, at the expense of other stars who could have risen up through the ranks and now it's sort of the do or die time because, 
Okay, Cena will be back, but with this type of venture away, with this reality show he did for Fox, this competition series, you know, you start. This is the first time Cena's made this type of exit and done something non WWE oriented. I mean, aside from cameos and movies. Yeah. You know, aside from the WWE's own movies, and then aside from some of the comedy stuff he's been doing recently, this is. Um, and I think maybe maybe it was train wreck. Maybe it was this type of stuff that got people in his ear saying, "Hey, you know, you can." do maybe not what the rock's doing and to that extent but you can do your own thing you can find your own market outside of this world and as his body wears on him and as he's you know he's got to be hurting all all kinds of pain you know with uh, you know how yeah, with the long way he's he works been, yeah as long as he's been doing it and in the main event spot he's been in for so long uh and so you have to start wondering like how many more years is cena going to be there and how much will he be around? I mean, like, how much of a schedule will he be working even if he is around uh, with this type of venture that he's doing, which is a first-time thing for him? Um, so they, the WWE's hand really got forced here as far as with Rollins' injury and Cena being gone and Orton, too, because you know if Orton was around and wasn't injured, um, he would have been the fallback main eventer. Yeah, you probably. Know, like, you know, so they didn't have him either. So... Yeah, this is when, and I do think that it's going to be rocky for a while, but I do think this is necessary, and it's all playing catch-up. It's it's their own fault. It is their own fault. And but, and, and I don't know, and I look, I still don't know that it's going to change because you look at guys that they have that they're bringing up that you would think they might have learned from their past mistakes, but they look like they continue to make the same mistakes because you look like somebody with, like Neville, who's just kind of, what, what are they doing with him? Or somebody like Tyler Breeze, who they just brought up who they're already starting to kind of undercut a little bit. So you have to say at, at some point they're going to have to let some of these horses run and see what they have and not play it so safe. Let them have a little bit of run. Let them have a little bit of momentum and see how the crowd responds to it and not be so impatient to pull the plug on something very quickly because something like the New Day shows, sometimes you got to stick with it long enough and see and, and let it take hold. And, and, and if it happens, maybe it'll work. <laughs> So what you're saying is that we should wait until probably the Raw after WrestleMania this year, and then that crowd will tell us who the new stars will be <laughs> for the coming year, and who should turn heel, and who should stay with stick with what they're doing, or who should do a, a complete 180. Well, that crowd, that, is, that, that no, crowd I mean, is pretty that, unpredictable. That, I mean, but that's what I mean. That's what the, therein lies the new uh, the new new day. You know, that's where. They came out and got the New Day sucks, and that's they re- went from there. Yeah, and, um, and, and as they had pushed them differently. So, you know, I, but, but once again, they, they didn't pull the plug on it. Like, they, it, 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 look, yeah, they, yeah. they tried to yeah, fly in the face of the crowd, and ultimately, like, they just they couldn't do anything about it, much like they did kind of with Daniel Bryan. They tried to fly in the face of the crowd, and eventually they had to change what they were doing. I think too quickly when they see something isn't working, they are very quick to pull the plug on it rather than kind of weather the storm a little and see if they might come out uh, on the other side okay. And I think they need to start doing that with some of these guys to see what they have because – Neville, Tyler Breeze. I mean, no, Dolph Ziggler's damaged as it is, but you got a lot of guys who are on the up and up. You know, Finn Balor, Samoa Joe. You know, you have these guys at your disposal who you can do something with. And at, at the very f- beginning, when they're brought up, they're not going to be widely accepted. So you got to kind of stick with it and push till they get there. And then they might be okay. Yeah, yeah. They got to stick with it. I agree. All right. Um, that's it. That's the show. So uh, that this has been Just the Worst Podcast, episode number 14. Matt Fowler, thank you very much, man, for taking the time out and, and joining. See, you made it all the way through. You talked wrestling. I did. I did. I talked time. wrestling for a long time. See, and it's it's exciting. It's very freeing. <laughs> so so uh, before we let you go, let everybody know where it is that they could find you on the interwebs. Um, on Twitter, I'm on the Matt Fowler. And then uh, you can find uh, my wrestling wrap-up column on IGN. It's every um, Tuesday. You could see it on IGN's main page or just go to the TV section. And then also uh, occasionally I interview wrestlers and recap pay-per-views and stuff like that. So I have, I have th- those type of features there too. See, so there you go. And, uh... and, I, and I write about other TV. but. <laughs> Not, not just wrestling. Not just yeah. a little bit of everything, but but there is still lots of wrestling. So for if you're listening to this podcast, obviously 
uh, now you have more wrestling to, uh, to, to feed into. Uh, you can also follow us here on social media as well, uh, at JTW Podcast. That is the official Just the Worst Podcast uh, Twitter account, so at JTW Podcast, and on Facebook, facebook.com slash Just the Worst Podcast. I'm there as well on Twitter at Infamous Kid, and on Facebook, facebook.com slash Billy the Kid. Uh, all the podcasts under the Just the Worst Podcast umbrella you can find right now on SoundCloud. So head over to soundcloud.com, search for Just the worst podcast and everything should come up and um and over the holidays we will make sure that we have all the feeds set up so your rss itunes and stitcher feeds they are in the work so just be a little bit more patient i know i say this every week but just a little bit more patience maybe it's our christmas present to you or your hanukkah or kwanzaa or festivus whatever you're getting it and you'll be able to set up those subscriptions uh pretty shortly so um other than that you can find my work at joeblow.com also on the this is infamous youtube page and uh, right here at Just the Worst Podcast. And uh, that's it. This has been uh, our wrap-up and our reaction for WWE's TLC special event. I'll be back next week with another guest, as usual, to talk wrestling. And a month from now, a little more than a month from now, uh, I'll be in Orlando, actually, for the Royal Rumble. So we'll have something special planned uh, as we recap the Royal Rumble on that entire weekend. So for Mad Fowler, who, once again, you can find at IGN TV, I've been your host, Bully Donnelly. This has been Just the Worst Wrestling Podcast, episode number 14. So make sure you hit those ropes hard and kick out before the count of three. Uh, and until then, we're out. We'll see you like next week. Peace. <coughs>Just the Worst Wrestling Podcast, episode number one, has been a presentation of Just the Worst Podcast Media.